here. Thank you all. All right, good morning and welcome. My name is Dan Fisk. I'm IRI's Executive Vice President, so it's a pleasure to be with everyone this morning. Uh, both Lauren and our speaker today, our guest speaker, Steve Began, are individuals with whom I had the opportunity to work at various times during our respective careers. So for me, this is a, a really particular privilege uh, to be able to participate and join you all for this event in Lauren's memory. And we'll start this morning with uh, welcoming remarks from IRI's chairman, uh, Senator Dan Sullivan. So uh, Mike, please proceed. Good morning and welcome to this second annual memorial lecture in honor of the life and legacy of IRI's longest serving president, Lauren Craner. This is a great lecture series because it exemplifies Lauren's lifelong commitment to human dignity and political freedom and seeks to pass on these values to the next generation, including Lauren's daughter, Isabel, who is working on the IRI staff with our European team. I want to thank Isabel, Lauren's wife, Anne, and their sons, Alexander and Charles, for being with us here today. As we convene today, international events are showing just how important IRI's work is, and that of the entire NED family in terms of their work as well. It's supporting those who seek freedom and human rights and peace among nations. That's what our goal, that's what our mission at IRI is. Russia's brutal invasion of Ukraine underlies, underlines and underscores the importance of this mission in a hugely important way. Every day, we're seeing it in the paper, seeing it on TV. During Lawrence's tenure at IRI, he put special attention on supporting activists in Russia who sought to keep that country from devolving back into authoritarian rule. Lauren also had a long-standing interest in Asia, and early on he saw the need for pro programming in that part of the world, including with Chinese partners. For this year's lecture, IRI is hosting the Honorable Steve Began, who is the former Deputy Secretary of State. Steve's perspective and experience couldn't be more relevant and timely. He has tremendous experience, including a stint at the National Security Council staff in the Bush administration, where Steve and I served together and became friends. He was also IRI's resident program director in Russia in the early 90s, and he was the U.S. Special Representative for North Korea and now is a board member of the NED. Steve brings a breadth of experience that can help all people around the world who are supporting democracy and promoting civil society. To those turning in today, thank you for your commitment to the cause of political freedom and democracy. And thank you to my friend, Steve Began for your great work for our country and for speaking at the second annual Lorne Craner Memorial Lecture. Enjoy. Uh, Lauren and I met early in our careers, both young House staffers interested in the United States role in the world and a shared commitment to public service. It was a period when El Salvador and Nicaragua were as much a topic of policy and public debate, and sometimes very contentious public debate, as nuclear weapons and the course of the US-Soviet superpower competition. It was the Cold War. We did not know it at the time. We were in the closing chapters of that competition. Whether working on the Hill, in the two Bush administrations, or in the think tank and do tank arenas, as Lauren used to call IRI a do tank, Latin America and advancing the democratic aspirations of the region were a common bond for Lauren and me. This theme of supporting Democrats would be a foundation for the interaction between Lauren and me for more than three decades including his encouragement to me to join the Institute upon my departure from government service. In the course of this, Lauren's life took on a new dimension and new meaning when he met Anne. 
So in fact, I will remind Anne of this because I still remember clearly when she and I first met, she was then Anne Norton. It was at a gathering of Central America hands. I would say, and I'm not sure what you thought of that crowd. Uh, we were rather an eclectic group, and that's probably an understatement for those of you who knew about the Central America Policy Group in Washington at the time. But Anne, you, Isabel, Alexander, and Charlie, we are very, very pleased that you're with us today. And with this, I am pleased to welcome Anne to the podium for her remarks. So Anne, please, Mike is yours. Okay. <laughs> Thank you all for coming to this second Craner Memorial Lecture. It is great to see so many of you in person and many more virtually. First of all, thank you, Dan Sullivan and Dan Fisk, for your kind words this morning. I often find myself wondering what Lorne may have thought on a variety of subjects, and I truly wish that I could ask him what he thinks of the war in Ukraine the tension between China and Taiwan, and the situation in Afghanistan. I could go on and on. Each of these talks helps me to try to picture his response. So a very special thank you to Steve Began, who will enlighten us all on, a very, on the very topical subjects of Russia and Ukraine. I also want to thank Congressman Colby for your words this morning. Finally, I want to thank Dan Twining Dan Fisk and the whole IRI team for your work organizing this event and the work that you do every day. As you know, Lorne devoted his professional life to building freedom around the world. He was always optimistic, generous and willing to give all of himself to this the most noble of pursuits. As most of you know, few things made him happier than seeing democracy triumph and, the, and flourish. Lorne always referred to IRI as a do tank. <laughs> he was so proud of this distinction and the work that IRI does in the field to make a change in the world. So thank you all for your belief in the cause of democracy and all your hard work towards this goal. Keep up the good work. All right, and now we will have uh, the introduction of our guest speaker today by uh, former Congressman Jim Colby, who is also a member of IRI's Board of Directors. So, Mike. Good afternoon. Let me welcome everyone to this second annual lecture honoring Lauren Craner. I'm Jim Colby a member of the board of the International Republican Institute. And it is my honor to also welcome the individual who will be speaking to us today. But first, I'd like to say a few words about another individual this lecture series honors. It honors with his name. When I first came to Washington as a member of Congress in 1985, Lord Crater joined my staff in the early weeks of my term, covering national security and defense issues that came before the Congress. Although only recently out of college, Lorne had an unusually deep and expansive understanding of national security. In part, I'm sure, because of his family's long background in the military. But his judgment and his analytical skills were his to hone and develop. And he did that with extraordinary deftness. Clearly, Lorne was destined for greater things than working for a freshman member of Congress. And indeed, he went on to serve as the foreign policy advisor to our beloved Senator John McCain on the National Security Council and then in the State Department as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Legislative Affairs, then as Assistant Secretary for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. But the position Lorne held longer than any other in his brilliant career a career tragically cut short by his untimely death two years ago, was as president of IRI, not once, but twice, first from 1995 to 2001, then again from 2004 to 2014. In that capacity, Lorne not only managed a strong team that endures today at the organization, 
but was a determined voice for the advancement of freedom and democracy around the world. His efforts inspired legions of people in countries that even today carry on the struggle for democracy and human rights. Countries like Ukraine and Myanmar, Cuba and Venezuela. It is fitting today that we honor Lorne's legacy with remarks from Steve Began, who has more than three decades of international experience in government and in the private sector. His most recent role in government service was as Deputy Secretary of State, confirmed with a strong bipartisan vote of 90 to 3, almost unthinkable in today's hyperpartisan environment. Prior to that service, he was the U.S. Special Representative for North Korea, National Security Advisor to Senate Majority Leader Bill Frist, as a deputy in the White House to National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice. He also served a stint as Vice President of International Government Relations for the Ford Motor Company. Interestingly, three decades ago, Steve served in Moscow after the fall of the Soviet Union as the resident director in the Russian Federation for the IRI. So Steve Began has his own connection to the International Republican Institute. It seems fitting that today he makes these remarks as a participant in the Lauren Craner Lecture Series. We look forward to your remarks. Steve? Good morning, and uh, thank you all for coming today. Uh, to those of you here in person, and those of you who are uh, joining us virtually, um, I'd like to start by uh, thanking Senator Sullivan and Congressman Colby for their kind words. Uh, that was more than enough about me, uh, since the point of this lecture is not me, but but Lauren himself. Also, um, I want to thank Anne and Charlie and Alex for being here today uh, to join us. And, and I also um, want to uh, acknowledge Judy Van Rest, who's not here with us today, who is also a dear friend of all of us, of Lauren and, uh, and who we miss. Today I am going to try in, in just a few short minutes to cover three issues. One is a little bit uh, uh, to rebuild for some of you a little bit the excitement and the experience of opening the first resident program office in Moscow in the early 1990s. The second is to talk a little bit about how I think we should think about Russia today, particularly through the context of the work that we do here at IRI. And third, uh, to finish with a few thoughts on Lauren's legacy. In uh, August of 1991, Mikhail Gorbachev, the General Secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, was on his August holiday in the beach resort town of Sochi when he was overthrown by a group of coup plotters in Moscow who promised to return the glory of the Soviet Union uh, to the Soviet people. Mikhail Gorbachev in, in 1989, 1990, was the fourth General Secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union in just the previous decade. Each of his predecessors had died uh, of, of uh, their conditions, of their age, representing the decay and the decrepitude that the Soviet Union had reached at that point. Mikhail Gorbachev brought a breath of fresh air. He was not committed to transforming his country into a democracy or to take the steps that were ultimately taken after his resignation from office. But he was representative of the future, and that's why he was overthrown in August of 1990, which set in motion, in turn, the collapse of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union, upon its collapse, broke into 15 constituent parts. And in 1992, the Russian Federation became an official and legal entity, uh, and IRI began its work in Russia. And that's the year that my work with IRI began as well. In the fall, in, in the late fall of 1992, I moved uh, to Moscow, selected an apartment, um, set up uh, the, the foundations of a program, returned home for Christmas, and, and a few short weeks later, my wife and I moved to Russia to begin what was then uh, IRI's second resident program office globally. The first having been uh, opened in Bulgaria uh, just uh, a year before. It was an amazing time. I cannot capture for you 
the excitement that those of us who had worked or studied or lived in the Soviet Union, I cannot capture for you the excitement that we had at that moment. Mm. It is unequal to waking up tomorrow morning and having seen perhaps the Communist Party of China having fallen. It's how today you would understand it for those of you who weren't alive in that era. Uh, my wife and I moved to Russia. We began to uh, build out a program there that uh, we hoped would in time bring a true foundation of democracy uh, to the Russian people. And when I think about what we were trying to do, I, I, I reflected upon the words that Ronald Reagan used 40 years ago last week when he announced the creation of this grand endeavor by the United States of America to support the development of democracy around the world. He said, the objective I propose is quite simple. This is not cultural imperialism. It is providing the means for genuine self-determination and protection for diversity to those who seek it. And that's what we did. We never pushed democracy on the Russian people. The appetite was insatiable. We were stretched thin. We hired as fast as we could. Within just a few short months, we had 10 people on the staff, complemented by a couple of Americans and as well as a number of great Russian staff. And I do recall at that point also, every morning at about nine o'clock in the morning, we had 10 people coming into our apartment to work for the day. And that's when my wife suggested we find a second place to live. <laughs> and so we moved and that became IRI's office for years ahead. Um, it was a fantastic team, highly motivated, skilled Americans and Russians who understood the moment that they were in and had the support of IRI back home. After we acquired our apartment, after we set up our office, we even went so far as to set up a satellite office in St. Petersburg, and then we embarked upon a grand mission. NDI, the National Democratic Institute, had arrived in Moscow about six or eight months before me under the guise of the then director of their program, Ambassador Michael McFall. And Mike and I were friends and acquaintances and informally sought to divide up the responsibilities in Russia. NDI having arrived sooner than us, you know, enviously had a lock on the senior leadership in the democratic movement in Russia. In Moscow, they had relationships with all the established leaders, and it was seemed uh, unnecessary and even redundant for us to try to do the same, just to, despite the fact that that was where the glory was in those days. But what we decided was we would focus on the regions, and so we did. We set up a, a template for programs. We would arrive on one day, we would have a dinner for our organizers and the key leaders, of the political movements in some particular locality in Russia. We'd spend the next day in a day-long seminar. We'd host all of the participants, sometimes a dozen or two, sometimes a couple hundred. We'd host them for a dinner in the evening, uh, which was a great celebration. And then the next day, we would finish with a few other topics, and we would always end with the same thing. We met with the women leaders in the community, business leaders, political leaders, elected officials, oftentimes so busy incidentally that they could not have attended the conference itself but we had a team meeting and each time we met with them there was a promise that someday we're coming back and we're going to do just a women's program and we did after after a year and a half we pulled together this collection of extraordinary women from across russia and we hosted a several day conference in novgorod russia with a huge complement of iri trainers probably uh, 20 to 30 trainers coming in from IRI, uh, and it was a fantastic program in a remarkable moment in in uh, in the development of and, and pursuit of democracy in Russia. Needless to say, and, and perhaps this is even, well, needless to say, that group of people had not been in power and not had been invested in the old system. And I still believe that one of the most important places for us to find the future of democracy in Russia is, is in the mothers and the, uh, and, the, and the women in that society. It was an amazing time. Just to tick off a few, and I'm leaving some out. We did programs in Vyborg, Novgorod, Yaroslavl, Moscow and St. Petersburg, Smolensk, Voronezh, rostov Nadanu, Voronezh, Lepetsk, Samara, Saransk, Volgograd, Chelyabinsk, Perm, Berezniki, Arkhangelsk, Severodvinsk, Petrozavodsk, 
Tomsk, Novosibirsk, Irkutsk, Khabarovsk, Vladivostok, and that's not even all of them. That's just the ones I could remember this week as I was pulling together remarks. We covered the breadth of the country. We brought trainers. We we developed our programs not based upon what we were pushing, but what they were what they were asking. We did media training. We did individual communications training. We brought a video crew and we had people practice public speaking on video. And then we had experts in public speaking critique and advise them on how to improve their development. We brought campaign uh, technicians. We brought people who we really especially benefited from uh, the experience of international trainers who had come from more rudimentary democratic systems or people from local elections. I do remember the time we had a trainer starting to talk about satellite uplinks which to the Russians would be like talking about campaigning on the moon. And, uh, and, and so we had, we had to make sure to tailor the, the techniques and the technology, but it was technical assistance. We didn't have to convince these people that democracy was not only their birthright, but it was achievable. Um, they knew that we needed to help them figure out technically and in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in financially and physically how to actually build that democracy. And so we did. It was great work in 1993, the first, the first year we were there. Many of these cities I ticked off were formerly closed cities, places where no foreigner had ever been permitted before. And yet we were able to bring this roadshow in and help their local community activists who were there even in those places, even in the closed cities that were on the, uh, on the fringes of the prison camps, the gulag that had kept so many of their forebears captive. It was a mix of people. Some of them had a very rudimentary understanding of, of democracy. Uh, some of them were truly damaged by the experience that they had endured for the previous decades. Um, some of them were just desperate for contact with the outside world. And many of them, many of them knew less about their own government than we did. In fact, one of the things I would routinely do as a hospitable American um, is I would invite uh, many of the participants so I'd meet someday if you're ever in Moscow, come by, drop by the office, come see us. And this was still when the apartment was our office. And my wife many times and I many times were woken up by the doorbell ringing at eight in the morning on a Saturday, someone who had just gotten off a train and the first place they took a beeline for was our apartment. And so we always had a steady supply of bread and jam and tea. We'd host them for a little breakfast. And then I would give them a tour of Moscow. I would walk Russians around their capital that I'd now lived in for a year and a half and, and knew like the back of my hand. And I would show them the historic buildings and tell them where amazing things happened. These were people who just two years before needed a special passport approved by the KGB if they were to travel to their own capital. And here I was an American as a tour guide for them in their nation's capitals. The work got a little more challenging in 1994. Um, we did open sessions. We had Communist Party members who came. They were respectful. Um, they were uh, even uh, 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 even cooperative. Less less so, so were the Liberal Democratic Party members, so Vladimir Zhirinovsky's party. But our view was, we can't be exclusive. We have to keep an open door, and hopefully they'll just make the right choice and leave. And often came, oftentimes, after a little bit of disruption, that was the solution that they took. So that was our experience. That was IRI in the 1990s. And I'm happy to talk more about it, Dan, if you want to cover it in, uh, in the Q&A. Let me talk a little bit about now about the future of Russia um, and what we see. Again, quoting Ronald Reagan in his, his uh, 1992 speech before the British Parliament that was the, uh, was the uh, announcement to create the National Endowment for Democracy. He said in that speech, we have not inherited an easy world. There is first the threat of global war. No president, no Congress, no prime minister, no parliament can spend a day entirely free of this threat. And I don't have to tell you that in today's world, the existence of nuclear weapons could mean, if not the extinction of mankind, then surely the end of civilization as we know it. Sadly, for many of us who lived through that period, there are echoes of the past in what we see today happening with this horrible, this brutal Russian invasion of Ukraine. It's a war char characterized by in intense inhumanity, uh, war crimes. The American response has been sanctions and the shipment of American weapons and Western arms for soldiers to kill 
the Russian soldiers invading their country. But I cannot help but also be moved by the thought that those could be the sons or grandsons of the people with whom we once worked in the 1990s, not there by choice, but there by the orders of an undemocratic, chauvinistic, anachronistic leader who seeks to reestablish some insane vision of dominance on the territories of the former Soviet Union. It appears rather hopeless. When I worked on Russia a lot, which isn't so much these days, but when I did, we had great days and we had horrible days. We had days when everything worked and we had days when nothing worked. And, and we learned that in the long run, it's all about the averages with Russia. Um, my view uh, and watching others uh, give up on Russia, to, to, to turn on the Russia even of those days was an observation that when it comes to Russia, your disappointment is the delta between your expectations and the reality. And the more outsized the expectations were, the greater the delta, the greater the disappointment. And, and I saw that over and over and over again. Some famous figures of the 1990s who were among the most enthusiastic supporters of a free and democratic Russia in time turned to become some of Russia's harshest critics. Now, of course, this wasn't in a vacuum. As I said, not only were were are terrible things happening now, but the trends were bad and getting worse uh, throughout that period. Another conclusion I reached, especially after 2014, when it became abundantly clear that we were moving in a direction that would likely end where we are today, was don't give in to Putin, but don't give up on Russia. And I stick with that mantra to this day, just by chance. Two nights ago, my wife and I had dinner with Natalie, N Natalia Arno. Natalia, for those of you who don't know her, is a Russian. She lives here in the United States. She was exiled uh, out of Russia in 2014 as the last resident program director of the International Republican Institute. So in a way, that dinner two nights ago were the bookends of IRI's work in Moscow. Um, I opened the office in 1992 in and uh, Natalia closed it in 2014. Natalia spoke eloquently at the dinner we were at together about the work of her organization, the Free Russia Foundation, and its efforts to continue to work in and with Russians, just as I know IRI is committed to doing as well. Since she was kicked out of Russia, exiled, she's a Russian citizen from Buryatia, no less, the, the locality from which Putin is drawing most of the soldiers to fight in Ukraine because of the poverty and lack of options that those young men have. He finds them to be the most likely recruits for his cannon fodder in Ukraine. Natalia today is one of the leaders among the dozens of organizations that continue to work on Russia from outside Russia. She works with the thousands of activists who have left Russia and journalists and others, but who expect to go back to Russia soon. And she works with the tens of thousands of Russian citizens who have fled the Russian Federation since Vladimir Putin's depredations have given them no other choice. It is, as Ronald Reagan said, a challenging moment, but we need to understand that there are those still in Russia, the ones that we met with, we worked with, in 1992, who remain in Russia and likewise remain committed to a better and brighter future for their country. People who long ago made the commitment to live in a democratic society and who will someday again rise to that challenge. And despite the passions, despite the horrors of this war, my appeal to all of you and to all of my colleagues who work on or with the Russian Federation is don't give up on Russia. Don't give in to Putin, but don't give up on Russia. <laughs> A last uh, quote that I would like to read from Ronald Reagan is one that in my view applies most to Lauren Craner. In that same speech 40 years ago, Ronald Reagan said, 
It has been said that an institution is the lengthening shadow of a man. These words come to life when we look at Lawrence legacy here at IRI. In 1992, as I mentioned, we opened the second resident program office globally for the International Republican Institute. Today, there are more than 60 such offices around the world and another 20 overseas programs run from, run from here. In 1992, our entire budget to meet the democratic challenge around the world was less than $7 million. And today, this year, it exceeds $100 million. That is a legacy. And that's a legacy of Lauren's leadership. His, present, his presence is felt to this day, not only by those who loved him, but those who knew and worked with him as well. And it'll be seen here in the years ahead by those of you who are listening to these remarks and those of you who are virtually attending today. But beyond the overseas budgets, the overseas offices in the, in the larger budgets, the work of building democracy is more specifically a personal work, a personal commitment, a personal effort, not only abroad, but here in our own country. Of course, there are times when we have to stand up and fight. There are times when the brave soldiers in defense of democracy, as we see in Ukraine, including some of your IRI colleagues today, fighting against the Russian invasion. Of course, there are times when we have to take a stand, but that's not enough. We also have to partner and we have to build and we have to be guided more than just our vigorous defense of democracy. We also have to be guided by compassion and empathy and respect, even for those with whom we disagree. These are the behaviors of a functioning democracy and they were the behaviors modeled by your former leader, Lauren Craner. Above all, the people who worked for him knew that he looked out for them. Ann and I spoke last week about Lauren's deep devotion to his teams, to those of us who had the responsibilities of working abroad, far away from our homes, far away from our families, and the risks that can come with our work. Those risks are especially high because the places where we work are the societies in transition where there are forces in those societies who would seek to stop the ambitions of people seeking a democratic law-based society. Even more dangerous are those societies in which those democratic liberties are falling apart and being taken away. To Lauren's children, I will tell you what, what you and your mother certainly know but those of us with IRI know as well. Lauren cared deeply for his family, but he considered IRI to be his family too. He shared the pain and carried the anxiety of the IR team, IRI teams uh, in the face of the many risks they faced. And it came in many different ways and sometimes with great tragedy. Ford lost one resident program officer, John Alvis in Azerbaijan, murdered likely for his work with IRI. Another IRI officer, Ron Abney, was severely injured in a grenade attack at a campaign rally in Cambodia. My colleague, Eric Rudenshield, in Kazakhstan, was severely beaten one evening walking home from a meeting with democratic activists. And in Egypt, Lauren rallied quickly to the imprisonment and incarceration um, of, of the IRI team ridiculously charged with crimes by the Egyptian government. And when Ann and I spoke about this, um, she surmised, and I agree, that this is probably from Lauren's own experience growing up. His own father being held captive in the Vietnamese prison camp, far away from home, the lonely and isolated existence. Lauren instinctively and intuitively knew not only the feelings of the person who was facing these challenges, but also those who loved them and cared for them at home. And he responded accordingly. As somebody who served in that role, I can tell you that I'm deeply grateful that there were leaders like Lauren back here at IRI. And for those of you who work with IRI, I'm sure that many of you felt that legacy as well. And I have no doubt that it was felt most of all by his beloved family. Thank you all.
Muchas gracias. Thank you, Steve. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Dan Twining. I'm president of IRI. Uh, that was really powerful and compelling and moving. So I'm going to ask you a few questions, Steve, and then uh, we will hear from all of you. We have microphones in the room. And people uh, watching virtually can queue up questions, which my colleague Austin will help us uh, navigate. I would like to begin, just to give you a, a chance to take a breath, Steve, by acknowledging my own debt to Lauren Craner. Uh, my first internship uh, when I was coming out of my first year at university was at a place called the International Republican Institute, uh, thanks to somebody named Lauren Craner, uh, who then, uh, as I was finishing up my summer internship, asked me what I would like to do the following summer. And he said, you really, you should go work on Capitol Hill. And I said, that sounds great, but I have no idea how to do that. And he said, leave it to me. Uh, about six months later, I got a letter from Senator John McCain saying, congratulations, you've been accepted into my internship program, to which I had not applied. <laughs> but Lauren had applied. Uh, and that, of course, produced the best decade of my life, running around with John McCain uh, all over the world. I met my wife uh, through his office. I met Steve Began through his office. Um, when I started in the foreign policy advisor job there, after I got promoted, I was young and inexperienced. And Mark Salter, the chief of staff, gave me one bit of advice, which is anything you want to do, call Steve Began first, uh, which was very graceful of Steve. He didn't do it for me. He did it for John McCain. But I, I had like a Steve Began check uh, because you were there on the Hill. Uh, the other person I relied on a lot at the time was Randy Schooneman, who was also on the Hill there and is now our vice chairman at IRI. So all these things really tie together. I think in a really powerful family way, reflecting exactly what you said about Lorne and his touch and his commitment and the broader community we're all part of. Uh, so Steve, um, democracy is not doing very well in the world today. It's a very different time from the decade, the early 90s that you described. You're 100% right. What we see all over the world, our friends at the National Endowment for Democracy, on whose board uh, you serve, uh, see all over the world, is surging demand for democratic dignity and rights and accountability and responsiveness. Governments around the world are not necessarily providing those things that citizens value. Polling shows that nobody wants authoritarianism, technocracy, surveillance, all of these horrors that we've seen. Uh, but could you just compare the world that you worked in for IRI to the world today and maybe describe a little more what we need to do? Yeah, well, uh, the comparison will probably be discouraging uh, only in that I don't know that there has been such an extraordinary moment uh, in modern history, and it's hard to believe there will be because uh, I spoke about the excitement about the uh, end of the totalitarian uh, reign in the Soviet Union. But of course, this was preceded by the fall of Berlin Wall and the freedom of uh, uh, acquiring a freedom of all the uh, Warsaw, Warsaw Pact countries. And by the way, it was also matched in Africa by the end of the apartheid regime in, in South Africa. And Nelson Mandela, a heroic figure, went from prisoner of conscience to president of South Africa, and on and on and on. And uh, of course, it wasn't as neat and clean as it might look in hindsight. And it was very, very messy points. There were there was plenty of bloodshed and violence in the collapse of the Soviet Union. And there was also uh, a, a, a terrible war in the mid 1990s in the former Yugoslavia as this sense of democratic self-awareness and self-awareness was happening around the world. It happened in Asia too uh, and uh, in, in Myanmar. Uh, Aung San Suu Kyi was elected uh, uh, to lead Myanmar and then very quickly overthrown in a military coup before she could take office. It was in every corner of the world. And we were winning everywhere, Dan. Uh, the, the, the good guys were winning everywhere. And, um, and it, you know, we have to be careful not to be nostalgic or not to set the bar based upon that experience. And that's why Perhaps um, we need to be sure to match the experience and, and knowledge of my generation with the energy and, and enthusiasm of, of a younger generation. This is all doable. It's, it's what people want. I mean, that's what, that's what Dan was saying in short. And Dan speaks about what people prefer or not prefer based upon an extraordinary polling program that this organization runs. 
that when I was in government was beneficial to me in understanding issues like Belarus that, uh, that some of us here worked together on. We knew Lukashenko was going to lose that election. And we knew it because IRI knew it. And IRI knew it because it actually had asked the people that matter, the voters in Belarus. And that result in that sentiment will be replicated in many other places around the world. The challenge for us, at IRI I mean us, is how to be the catalyst without usurping the responsibility. Because ultimately, without leaders like Svetlana Tsikhanouskaya in Belarus, this can't happen. We don't, we aren't missionaries. Ronald Reagan was adamant about that. We will provide the technocratic support. We will provide the assistance. We will provide the platform. Um, the people have to own their own destiny. And that includes especially the Russian people. And so that's the challenge for you who are, who are with IRI today is to find that recipe. It'll take persistence. Believe me, in 1991, nobody thought the Soviet Union was going to collapse. Nobody thought the Soviet Union was going to collapse. Just as very few people thought Ukraine could defeat the Russian army. So keep the faith. Don't be guided exclusively by the uh, grand achievements of the past. And believe in your hearts that this is what the people around the world want. And this is how they want to be governed in free and democratic societies. Great. Well said. Um, Steve, uh, you and Lorne, and also actually Dan Sullivan, our chairman now in the Senate, uh, all have senior State Department experience. Uh, your point about missionary work is a very powerful one, because sometimes I go out into the world and talk to leaders, including in Asia, uh, where they sort of see us as missionaries and ideologues. Uh, Lorne taught us, you taught us, uh, that actually the work of democracy is quite pragmatic that fundamentally it's about solving people's problems and providing better opportunities for people than authoritarianism, various forms of strongman uh, rule can offer. Could you say something about your experience as a policymaker, as Deputy Secretary of State, but also in the White House, also on Capitol Hill, and how the democracy and human rights issues, you know, sometimes the national security crowd tries to marginalize these, but you've always been very good about integrating them, as was Lorne. Could you just speak to that? It's, it's a lot easier to do as the poacher than it is as the gamekeeper. <laughs> um, and there were, uh, I had moments of tribulation um, as Deputy Secretary of State approving a visa for a certain individual, whether to sanction another individual. Um, my, uh, and it, there's no one size fits all, except that you have to have a holistic view and see, and see if you can come up with a convincing rationale, if not to others, at least to your own principles and values. Can you come up with a convincing rationale that we let that guy into the country, he does the meeting, it stabilizes a government, that we can then find a way in our next iteration to, uh, uh, to move in the right direction and perhaps even sustain an opening that could lead to an even better and newer government coming. Um, and as hard as those decisions might have been to make um, in, the, in the 1990s and early 2000s, they're, they're even harder to make now. And they're as hard as they were to make during the Cold War. The United States uh, has a legacy, and not necessarily a proud legacy, but one that uh, you know, our forebears made on where they drew that line in the balance. I talked about that glorious moment when the apartheid regime fell in South Africa uh, at the end of apartheid. But you know, let us not forget that South Africa was also a close partner of the United States during that apartheid era um, against uh, the Soviet influence in Africa as a, as a silent partner, perhaps not an ally, but a silent partner of the United States in the fight against Soviet totalitarianism, despite the fact that it had a cruel and inhuman government that treated majority of its population as inferior beings. You know, those compromises have been made by generations of leaders. We have supported dictatorships across those years and, and corrupt authoritarians. Um, I hope, I hope, I hope that we can find something better than that in the years ahead. Um, 
but still uh, it is choices. And, and what animates that choice today for people in positions like I held is the People's Republic of China, which is constantly lurking out there, looking for the partnerships and friendships necessary uh, to advance its own agenda. Uh, just yesterday in the Financial Times, there was an, an article that, that beautifully illustrates this about the dilemma that President Biden has about his visit to Saudi Arabia. Human rights versus oil, human rights versus realism. I don't envy, I even have empathy for the policymakers in the Biden White House who have to make this choice. But as I looked at the article, the thing that really just lit me up was the picture of Mohammed bin Salman giving a high five to Vladimir Putin at a G20 meeting just a year ago. And the, just the warm, shit-eating grin on Putin's face, to coin a phrase. Uh, it just repulsed me. Um, I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad I don't have to make that decision. Yeah, well said. Putin is hopefully grinning less these days. He's got a lot of other problems at the moment. Um, can I ask you, Steve, I, we have a lot of friends and admirers of yours uh, virtually in here who are going to want to speak. So please queue up. Please come to the mic if you're in the room. Please pop your questions into the chat. I'm just going to ask you one last question while people mobilize. Uh, and I want to pick up on China, actually, and I wanted to pick it up before you mentioned it. So thank you, partly because Lorne and I always talked about China. And when I was going off to graduate school to Oxford to study Chinese and get smart on Asia, that was partly uh, on his good advice. Uh, you are right. It's the, uh, the elephant in the room, including in the democracy business, uh, in part because I think there used to be an assessment that China was not an ideological competitor, right? Uh, Xi Jinping thinks they're an ideological competitor. He and Vladimir Putin issued an extraordinary statement at the Beijing Olympics, essentially mapping out a world of a dystopian techno-authoritarian world in which the values, not of the Chinese people or the Russian people, but the values of the dictators of China and Russia govern affairs. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about where you see China going and uh, what we need to do in this era of authoritarian aggression, not only Russia against Ukraine, but frankly, China all over the world? Yeah, I, I read that statement, all, all 2,300 words of it, um, the partnership without limits. And uh, I wonder if, um, if there's not a little bit of buyer's remorse in Beijing these days. I hope so, although uh, Xi Jinping is not one who's inclined to publicly express his regrets or ever question his own judgment. Um, you know, Lauren did an extraordinary thing. Lauren actually had an IRI program in China. It just, it's unfathomable today. Um, it, was a, it was a gingerly few steps towards introducing concepts of the concept of democracy at the village level. And so it wasn't, it was, it was, it was properly, its ambitions were properly set so as to be seen as a pilot, but it was what it was. It was a chance to allow people uh, agency in selecting their leaders, albeit at the village level. And of course, that is inconceivable today. Um, you know, uh, there's a lot of forces that are eroding the direction of democracy around the world, and one of them is uh, authoritarianism or dictatorships. One of them is corruption. Uh, corruption is a, a huge component of almost every authoritarian regime, which with, we face no more, no more so, nowhere anywhere more so than in Russia. Um, but also nationalism is another one. In, 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 and, um, and I'm afraid in China, there are forces at work that are gonna make it very challenging for us uh, to find a way to properly encourage a move towards a more democratic society. I don't mean to be um, uh, pessimistic, but I think it's impossible as long as Xi Jinping leads that country. I think he has uh, a view that we studied intensely uh, in when I was in government and arrived at the most obvious c conclusions that the, what, what's, what guides him what is at the root of all of his policy is maintaining the supremacy of the Communist Party of China period. There are other secondary, tertiary, and, and, and uh, lesser ambitions, including sovereign territory and maritime space and so on that we know. But above all, it's, it's preserving the supremacy of the Communist Party inside the Chinese system. 
and he everything he does is devoted to that and um, I won't I won't get in uh, too far into the into the weeds here, but in, in 2011, Vladimir Putin faced protests in the streets of Moscow at a square called Bolotnaya Poshid, um, the white uh, ribbon protests, and it was the first and strongest popular manifestation of opposition to his regime during his tenure, uh, as during his now two decade tenure, two plus decade tenure as the leader of Russia. He was not the president at the time. Um, he was still executing a choreographed trade-off between his prime minister who switched to president and he switched to prime minister uh, with the intention of executing the reverse um, after meeting his constitutional requirement to serve a term out of the presidency. And these protests were so powerful that Vladimir Putin saw them as an existential threat. He realized as he went to bed that night that if he woke up in the morning he wasn't sure whether he was going to still be perceived as the leader of Russia or if he was on his way to jail. And he resolved at that point, in my view, and I trace, you know, there, there's a, was a steady decline in democracy uh, uh, in, in Russia throughout his tenure. But 2011 was a catalyst, a turning point at which he doubled down. It, it's no, it's no, no mistake, uh, uh, it's no uh, coincidence that in 2014, IRI and all other, practically all other organizations working with Russian civil society were expelled and he's been on a he's been on a course toward what we see today in the battlefields of Ukraine uh, since 2011 the same happened in China in January of 2020 when the COVID-19 pandemic broke out in Wuhan in Hubei province in China the Chinese Communist Party lost control of the narrative brave Chinese citizens who weren't guided by antipathy towards the Communist Party, but guided towards love and care for their own people sought to spread the word that this terrible virus was showing up in doctor's offices and in populations, and they were sounding the warning and subsequently they were arrested and repressed for having spread information that would panic or discomfort society, but more importantly, that would break free of the Communist Party narrative. And for a brief few weeks, the Communist Party of China lost control of the narrative. The Chinese social media app Weibo was filled with millions of messages of, that went much further than those brave doctors in Wuhan, condemning the Communist Party, questioning its competence, its leadership, its indifference to its own people. Just as Vladimir Putin in 2000, 2011 looked at the, at the square of Bolotnaya Ploshed and saw his fate hanging in the balance, I think Xi Jinping looked at the social media posts of millions of brave Chinese and realized that the Communist Party's supremacy in ruling China was at risk. And he did what all such authoritarians do. He treated his own people as the enemy. Vladimir Putin's number one concern every morning when he wakes up isn't the fight in the fighting spirit of the Ukrainian people or the sophisticated Western arms that are coming in. It's his own people. And the same goes for Xi Jinping. His biggest concern, if he was hand on heart, honestly confessing it, is his own people. And that's what we have to remember. Well said, thank you. Uh, let's take just a few questions. I'm sorry we're a little over, but we do wanna give you all a chance. Uh, so please just come up to the mic, if you would, uh, and put your mm -hmm. questions in the virtual chat. Austin, do we have anything yet in virtual? Okay, otherwise I'll just keep going. Anybody? Damon, thank you. Uh oh, <laughs> Dan, thanks for doing this, Steve. Um, it's just terrific to hear um, your reflections as the first country director in IRI, now as a board member at, at NED. So thank you for your leadership on this. You said, don't give up on Russia, but stand up to Putin. And in many respects, I think the only way you cannot give up on Russia is to stand up to Putin. Um, given your experience and, and what you just have said about this, as he creates a narrative of legitimacy for himself based on a more Peter the Great imperial conquering role, how do you see the threat from Vladimir Putin to his own people, to, um, to the West, beyond this Ukraine challenge? Where do you see things going, given the rationale he's laying out for the stake of his own regime, is seeding what could be an insatiable imperial thirst where the Russian people themselves could suffer most? How do you think about our ability to stand by Russians that want a different future. 
Yeah, so uh, thank you, Damon, and thanks for your leadership at the National Endowment for Democracy. When I say uh, don't give in to Putin and don't give up on Russia, I agree with you that it's not an either or. It's the two sides of the same coin. What I fear is a sentiment that I feel as a Russia expert, Russian speaker, um, that everything attached to Russia must turn to dust. And that is not in any way to give any comfort or succor to the people who are prosecuting or, or supporting this war. They're wrong, they're on the wrong side of history. And I hope uh, someday there will be accountability for the evil things that are being done in Ukraine and to the Ukrainian people. But at the same time, um, you know, I'm, I'm mindful of that Old Testament passage. I, th I think it was Lot who's leaving the city before God is gonna bring his wrath and destroy it. And he says something, I'm paraphrasing, I'm not a great biblical quoter, but he says something like, well, what if there's a hundred good people? And God says, I'll spare the city. And he says, well, I, if I may, what if, there's, what if there's 50 good people? God says, yeah, I'll spare the city. And he says, not to test your patience, but what if there's 10 good people? And he says, if there's 10 good people, I'll spare the city. And I'm paraphrasing, but that's how I think about it. There are good people in Russia. A lot of them have left Russia, Damon. And, and, and we have to work with them. But the much harder nut will be, uh, to crack will be the people who are in Russia. And that's where we really have to spend some time at Ned. You have to spend time at IRI think about, thinking about how to help them because they're the ones, this is not to take anything away from the ones who made the probably very wise choice to leave, but they're the ones who face the real risks. Unfortunately, considering the madness that, uh, that passes for governance in Moscow today, even people outside the country, as we know, are at risk even of, of life and limb. But inside Russia, um, that's where that's where the solution lies. I, you know, like every freedom-loving person, I am cheered by the successes of the Ukrainians, and I hope against hope that they can win this war. And I'm not even sure what win looks like, honestly. I have to tell you, but I just hope they win. Um, but my view is this war doesn't end in Kiev. This end war, this war ends in Moscow. That's where the pathway to ending this war is. I think it's highly improbable that the cronies with whom Putin has surrounded himself, who are equally culpable in virtually everything he's done, will ever be the catalyst for the kind of change that needs to happen. But I'm not giving up on the Russian people, as improbable as it may seem at this point. And again, Damon, I, I, as I said in my remarks, it's anchored in what I saw. This is not this is not hypothetical in my view. I have traveled to every corner of that Russia, not uh, of that country, not just as IRI resident program director. I spent another 15 years in the private sector, opening opening uh, uh, factories and, and businesses in Tatarstan and in, in Saint Petersburg and, and elsewhere. Um, I had Russians work for me, good people people who wanted a better life, who wanted to live in democracy and freedom, who were very reluctant to speak about it because the system was already less hospitable to at least public expression, public expression of those thoughts, but they're there. And so, you know, your challenge at IRI and yours at, at Ned and mine too, as your board member, is how do we support them? We don't overthrow the Russian government. That's not, that's not what we're doing. Regime change is not a good idea for us. But the Russian people get their choice, and we should do everything we can to make sure that they get to make that choice. Well said. We got. Hello, Steve. Um, thank you for this. Thank you for being here, for sharing your thoughts and the memories that you have from back when you were a part of the IRI team. You still are from a distance. Um, the question I have is, what connection do you see between domestic policy in the US and our foreign policy? We all have friends from abroad, and they oftentimes tell us that we're a little wishy-washy, that we become a little unpredictable. So do you necessarily see a connection between domestic policy, foreign policy, and what impact does that have on how the U.S. is perceived? Well, of course, there are, um, there's a, a huge intersection between uh, domestic policy and, and international policy, and specifically between politics and, and policy. I've served, I've worked, I've worked for 35 years uh, since getting out of college. 
uh, about 18 of that is in the government and, and every day of that was as a political appointee. I lived at the intersection of politics and policy and some years, you know, we were up and Republicans were, were making the calls. I, of course, I'm a Republican. In some years we weren't and we found a way uh, to try to influence the opposition. One of the most, probably one of my most enjoyable periods in foreign policy was in the mid 1990s when we both finally took a brave stand in the, in the conflict in Yugoslavia against a, a lot of reluctance here in the United States, where we, we finally helped end the depredations of, of Slobodan Milosevic, particularly against the Bosnian people, um, and the enlargement of NATO. Um, we were Republicans. I was working with John McCain, of course, with Bob Dole, and with many other Republican foreign policy leaders in the Senate, with a Democratic president, with, uh, with Bill Clinton. And that, it, that, that marks, for me, one of, the, one of the best periods of policy. We had uh, people of goodwill willing to work together towards common goal. And, and you know, that is something that uh, seems a little bit uh, scarce these days, but, but it's not gone. It's found in this room. There's, there's people who have come here today to celebrate Lauren's legacy who are not card-carrying Republicans. I can guarantee you that. I know some of them in this room. And, uh, and, uh, and you know, that, that uh, still exists. Um, you know, I, I, I can't move away from this topic without saying that um, we have to acknowledge that sometimes we aren't setting the best example for the world. We saw that in the events in our own country in the, in, uh, in, uh, January, on January 6th of 2020. Um, I was at the State Department that day and I was just sick to my stomach. I was, uh, like everyone else, except those at risk, a spectator to something that was just uh, the most horrible example that America could set for the world. And, uh, but I'm also uh, of a view that um, the foundations of our institutions and our democracy are great, so great that they can withstand even the most formidable of challenges. We have to be a good example. We have to gain the support of our own democratic people for the policies we seek. We shouldn't assume that every American uh, wants even the work that IRI does to happen around the world. So it's, you got to fight for it. Um, and, uh, and then we have, to, uh, we have to show through the strength of our own example um, a way for other countries that, that they, can, they can follow as well. Thank you, Steve. Uh, we're, we're timing out here. Uh, can we keep that? Can we keep it for the post chat? Just because we're over already, and uh, I would just like to close out by thanking you for the example you've set uh, across your career, but also your personal impact on all of us. Many of us are here in, with thanks to you for your support. So this this reminder that we all have a duty, which we learned from Lauren Craner, to invest and help uplift the next generation. Because guess what? Uh, none of us is going to declare mission accomplished. Uh, this work is not frankly, ever going to be over. It's always been a fight. You've reminded us of that. Many of us have forgotten our history, but it's always been a struggle in the world. There never was a perfect moment in America or the world where everything was okay. Uh, so we have a long journey ahead. We know we have allies and friends and partners, actually billions of them around the world, who want the same things that we enjoy in this country, which is freedom and opportunity and human dignity and individual rights. Uh, again, thank you for the example you've set. Thanks to the Craner family. Uh, really, it's a great honor for me just to try to carry on the Lauren Craner tradition at IRI. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Steve.